absolutely worth it. Shade Surgeon here, and today we're doing a deep dive into my 1986 Harley Davidson FXR, aka Barf Party, Vomit Comet Rising, and many other fell and weary, fearsome names. What is dead may never die, but only comes back stronger. So let's go over exactly what is going on under the hood on this FXR. At this point, the old FXR doesn't have a whole lot on it that is from 1986. It's got more in common with Johnny Cash's one piece at a time than it does with a Harley Davidson but we'll go over exactly what parts are from Harley, what parts are from Honda Goldwings, and everything else in between on this thing. Now, if you're not familiar with Barf Party or the Shade Tree Surgeon channel, you might be asking yourself right now, why do I care about going into a deep dive on the parts that are on this absolutely horrendous, horrible pile of junk, two-wheel tetanus shot, this horrendous machine that should be banished into the shadow realm? Well, things are not what they seem. Longtime viewers of the channel will remember when Barf Party Party died of Vikings death, battling the mountains of North Georgia in search of that fabled town named Helen. Those winding roads were its funeral pyre, but it has been brought back into the realm of mortals, kicking, screaming, and very angry, most notably with a six-speed transmission and a 124 cubic inch engine, but a little bit more on that later. Let's start from the top and work our way down. Starting at the very tippy top, as high as we can get, we have my swap meet special mirror. Every Harley Davidson needs a couple eagles, and if your Harley doesn't have eagles on it, I don't know what to tell you, man. It just ain't a Harley Davidson, is it? Moving down a little bit. Listen up, baby. I put these on here so you can always be on my mind. And if any of you ladies out there think I'm talking about you, I swear I am. Over here, I've got my Huffy handlebar pad in case I take it off any sweet jumps and uh, my roach holder up here for long rides. All the switches on the bike actually work now and they're all brand new. Again, a little bit more on the electronics and the Bluetooth capability of this bike later, but but it might surprise you. Up here, we've got some marine gauges that are meant for a boat and a custom backing plate made by the guys at the Ride Factory and the special edition 1986 FXR custom number plate. One of the few remaining pieces on this bike that's actually off the original bike besides the frame and the gas tank. I don't know who makes this windshield, but I hate it. And I gotta get one that's either a little taller or a little shorter because at my height, with the height of this windshield, the buffeting is absolutely atrocious. The fairing up here is off and 1986 FXR, just not this 1986 FXR. It came off an FXR D that was factory painted by the dealership in Milwaukee in 1986. Because Harley Davidson couldn't sell FXR Ds to save their life, they were competing with the Goldwing GL 1200 at the time. And let me tell you what, as somebody who has owned both, it ain't much of a competition. All the reproduction fairings don't have holes for the turn signals. Every once in a while, someone will wonder why I have duct tape up there. I have duct tape up there because factory Harley-Davidson turn signals that go into these fairings cost about $450 a piece, and I'm not paying that. Yeah, this fairing has definitely seen better days, but it's got charisma, baby. Up front, I've got your standard equipment LED light with the turn signals built into it. You could probably buy a really expensive one if you want. This is not a really expensive one. Coming back to the FXRD cockpit, I've got my good luck charm, my girl Thick Lizzie, and some custom leather work and diamond plate by Brian himself at the Ride Factory. Bars and risers, eh, also from some random swap meet lying around in a parts bin somewhere. You'll find that story repeated on a whole lot of parts on this motorcycle. Let me tell you something right now, you'll pry this this eagle gas cap cover out of my cold, dead hands. The tank, again, one of the few remaining things that's actually off the original motorcycle. Coming back from there, I got another swap meet special. I managed to score this LaPera seat. I love LaPera seats, though I do want to get a custom one made that's a little bit taller than this one. The rider triangle on FXRs is notoriously cramped, and if you're over six feet tall, you probably need a seat that's got a couple inches built into it. Coming back even further, random sissy bar that came off a of Sportster with my very custodial a quick release cotter pin mounts here, patent pending. Eagle sissy bar plates, of course, for extra horsepower. And the same bags off that 1986 FXRD, custom painted in 1986 by the Harley Davidson dealership that this bike was at. And well, this one actually needs a little bit of repair. FXR division to the rescue. Luckily, they still make a lot of parts for these old bikes, especially stuff for these bags that Harley Davidson hasn't made in a very long time. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, I just put that on backwards. Wiley Coyote, super genius. Hey, it was a 50-50 shot, huh? Always like to do things twice. Practice makes perfect, after all. Going down a little further, yes, the integrated turn signals. This bike has turn signals, although I use them about as often as a BMW driver does. And the rear fender, another rare part that's actually off the original motorcycle. Somebody sent me this flame side cover and it never fails to crack me up to have two different colored flames on Barf Party. Taking off this side cover over here will clue you into the fact that this bike is definitely not normal. I mean, I guess there's a lot of things that would clue you into it not being normal, but this entire motorcycle has been completely rewired and fitted with a Bluetooth M unit, courtesy of the boys at the Ride Factory. 1-800-ASH-SHELBY does not like to be disturbed late at night, so everything in here is as modern as it gets, like I said, including Bluetooth activation. Check this out. My FXR even has an app. How about that, baby? No ride ready. I can also turn it off with the Bluetooth. But my favorite part about this, because I'm not the biggest Bluetooth fan, is that I still have the option of using a key. But I will tell you, seeing the look on people's faces when you start this motorcycle with your telephone. No ride ready never gets old. Coming back down below the bike, I've got uh, some pretty terrible shocks on here. They're just 15 inch long progressive shocks and they are terrible. Underneath those shocks though, we've got a chain drive conversion, a Brox aluminum swing arm and upgraded newer bagger style swing arm bearings. Now, a lot of people ask about the swing arm, what it actually does and if you actually need one. There's a couple different reasons that you would upgrade to this big box aluminum style swing arm on an older bike. And the first one is because of the axle adjusters. Even if you don't have a big horsepower motor, the old steel swing arms were notorious for bending and pulling in the axle adjusters. They were just these little flimsy plates and if you tighten down the rear wheel, it would crush it in. The modern sportsters are still like that. Now there's a much cheaper solution than buying a box aluminum swing arm and that's hitting up my man Tim at Gigastat Cycles. He makes axle adjusters that are big solid blocks of aluminum that solve all those problems of it bending inward or sucking the axle plates into the swing arm. And it's a pretty cheap, I think they're like 150 bucks or something like that. Way cheaper than this swing arm, which was $500. I actually lied, there's two more reasons besides the axle adjusters. And the next reason is because it looks really freaking cool, man. And it does. Now the third reason is because of the motor. We've got a motor in this thing that's making 125, 130 horsepower. And I just didn't want to have the flex of a stock steel swing arm. I wanted a nice, stiff, big and thick thick aluminum swing arm back there to eliminate any flex from the motor going to the wheel, going to the ground. It's not like it would break it or twist it in half. It's not making that much horsepower, but it would have flex in it. And anytime there's flex, you're losing horsepower. So is it worth dropping the big money that these things cost? Brox is one of the cheaper ones. It's crazy to me to, to spend that much money, but I did want to eliminate the flex. Now, if you've got a newer bike, like a newer bagger, those newer swing arms, I believe that some people sell a kit to put the newer bagger swing arms on FXRs, that would be a great option as well. I just happen to go with the Brox because I think they probably end up being about the same amount of money, maybe a little less for the bagger swing arm. But if you see one of these big aluminum swing arms on a brand new bagger, they're just showing off because the new bagger swing arms are great. They don't flex. They're a great replacement for these old stock steel ones. Anyway, that's why I have it. So if you've got a hundred plus horsepower motor in your old FXR, your old Sportster, or your old like Evo Dyna or something like that, if you've got one of those going going on, then yeah, you would probably benefit from getting one of these swing arms. Now, are those benefits that you can see on a dyno chart? I don't really know. Are those benefits you're going to be able to feel? I also really don't know. And a lot of people would argue that it does nothing and I could have just ran the stock steel swing arm. I'll let you guys argue about it in the comments, but regardless, I've got it. And if it doesn't do anything else besides look cool, at least it does that. Now, before I hop over to the other side of the wheel, I can't forget about what is arguably probably the rarest part on this motorcycle. And that's an 18 inch American racing billet wheel in the back. We'll go to the front here in a minute and talk about that, but I think that the 18 inch rear and 19 inch front is just the best looking combo on an FX.
XR. And these older 18 inch billet rear wheels are getting really hard to find. I scored this one for a hundred bucks and I can't believe I got it. Coming over here on the show side of the bike, also speaking of Tim at Gigastat Cycles, this is one of his pieces here. This is a radial mount for an FXR. Now I had originally got this when I had a stock swing arm, so I had to modify it to work for this one. He does sell the kits to work with an aftermarket swing arm, but the boys at the Ride Factory modified this one to work with the with the Brox aluminum swing arm. And let me tell you, having this in the rear, it works. This brake works really well. Tim from Gigasat Cycles is not only an amazing engineer, but he's also a really good dude. I know him in person. I've been on rides with him for Sportster Summer. Amazing guy. I completely vouch for anything he sells on his website. I don't have to say anything nice about Gigastat, but I will because he's a good dude and he makes a good product. Now, finding a billet 19 inch front wheel is also kind of rare. Nowhere near as rare as the billet 18 inch rear though. Still, I was happy to find this one. It doesn't exactly match the rear, but it's close enough for rock and roll. And I also picked it up for a hundred bucks. So I ain't complaining. Swap the front end over from a 35 millimeter that came on an 86 FXR stock to a 39 millimeter off a of Sportster with two inch over tubes. I've got race tech emulators in there, but I think I'm probably going to do something more at the front end. Tim from Gigastat Cycles would definitely disagree with me because he's spoiled because he runs GSXR front ends on all of his bikes or upside down forks, or whatever they end up coming off of. And they're way stiffer than a 39 millimeter. These things are spaghetti noodles compared to the forks that Gigastat runs on his bikes. And if I didn't have this 39 millimeter front end, I wouldn't be able to run the front fender, which was painted by hand by Shea Lisi, which is my favorite part of this motorcycle. So how would I be able to run this front fender that was painted by my niece if I don't have a 39 millimeter front end. So it's staying for now. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and upgrade it to the Traction Dynamics internals. Yes, this motorcycle has Honda parts on it. The <laughs> Tokiko in the rear, Tokiko in the front, except this one's off an 80s Goldwing. When I only had one front brake on this, I wanted to do a cheap brake upgrade over the old school single pot calipers that Harley had on 39 millimeter front ends. I think that this adapter kit was like a hundred bucks and uh, the Tokiko brakes, I got for free. Now, eventually I did get a right-hand slider with brake tabs. And when I put that on, I also had lying around in my pile of parts, a performance machine <laughs> brake calipers. But despite the fact that they're pretty mismatched, I mean, you can't see them both at the same time, right? So you got two different moods to the motorcycle. Despite the fact that they're mismatched, they actually work amazing. They've got great feel. Performance machine brakes are awesome. So are the Tokikos. So I'm not unhappy with how the front end performs. Of course, can't forget about my KC Daylighter, which I only ran when I was running the stock incandescent front headlight and I needed a little bit of extra light on the back roads. Now that I have an LED on here, it really don't need this, but it still looks pretty cool. So I'm going to leave it on there. All right, let's get into the beef. Over here on the drive side of the bike, I have an Ultima Open Primary that has been modified to use mid controls by none other than the boys at the Ride Factory. Now BDL makes a really nice open primary for baggers and of course FXRs. You need a short primary for these. It's not like the long primary on soft tails. So your options are kind of limited. I went with the Ultima because it's cheaper, quite a bit cheaper actually. Now whether it holds up as good as a BDL unit, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, but I'll be honest about it if it does or if it doesn't. Now the real question, why did I go with an open primary, especially on an FXR and especially on an FXR with mid controls? There's several reasons not to go with an open primary and one really good reason. The bad reasons are that they're, they're noisy, they're technically kind of dangerous. You can get your pant leg caught in them or your foot caught in them. All the old heads out there will definitely have stories about getting a shoelace or a pant leg stuck in an open belt primary. It's also really noisy. If anybody out there owns a Ducati, you're very familiar with this noise. And for anybody who's never been around an open belt primary and a dry clutch, when you hear this thing start up and sit around in an idle, it just sounds like something's breaking. Just this high pitched metallic rattling sound, which if you're used to it, that's just what they say sound like and it doesn't bother you at all. And if you're not, you think that something's broken. It also has dick for clutch feel compared to a, <laughs> compared to a wet clutch. The dry clutch is super grabby. You don't have as much of a friction zone. The, the wet clutch is better. Now, those are three really good reasons to not run an open primary on your motorcycle, especially a motorcycle that's supposed to be kind of sporty like the FXR. But the one reason I do have an open primary on this motorcycle is because it looks really freaking cool, man. And that one reason just kind of trumps everything. 
thing, doesn't it? Because if it doesn't look cool, what the hell is it doing on a motorcycle? A lot of people will hate me for saying that because they just are so like, you know, function over form, but I don't really care, man. I wanted an open primary on the FXR and I got an open primary on the FXR. I have zero regrets, at least yet. Over here on the business side of the motor, we've got an all balls high torque starter and we definitely need it because it's turning over 124 cubic inch total performance engine. Now, some of you guys might not be familiar with total performance. These TP engines were around for a little while. I believe that they're still in business. They mainly make their fuel pumps, which were way better than the stock Harley units. These TP engines also had different heads, different intake ports. They take square intake ports. I mean, there's a a bunch of little things about them that make them not quite an Evo. Still an Evo for sure, but not quite an Evo. They got a lot of upgrades to them. Like I said, I think they're still in business. Their website is kind of weird and kind of funky and doesn't really give a whole lot of information. Whether you can still get an engine from them or not, I have no idea. Now, as far as why I have this engine is because I lucked into it, uh, as I did a lot of these parts. It came out of an old school dad chopper from the mid 2000s that somebody had wrecked and now it's in this bike. Should be making somewhere in the neighborhood of 125, 130 horsepower. I've got a Makuni HSR on it. Like I said, I haven't dyno tuned it, so I just don't know. But let me tell you, it does not feel like riding any other Evo I've ever put miles on. The reason why it took me so long to get the bar party back on the road is I spent over a year just collecting parts. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted a big inch motor, but it takes time. I bought an SNS 113 that was kind of in parts. This 124 came completely together. I got it for a thousand bucks, which is pretty insane considering that these things retailed in the mid 2000s. I'm talking like 2003, 2004 for $10,000. The chopper that it came out of only had a couple thousand miles on it and so even if those couple thousand miles were spent bouncing off the rev limiter i'll say i got a pretty damn good deal and out of the same dad chopper came this transmission which is a baker six speed overdrive and it is nice the only bummer about the baker six speed is that this 124 came out of a soft tail chassis so it didn't have an fxr or bagger style transmission case and the baker case was a full show polish so it, that, that was a bummer, but that's all right though. We cleaned up a bagger case and just put all the Baker internals inside of it. And it still looks good, just not quite as good as, as the show polished Baker case would have looked. And of course, some people are probably rolling their eyes when I talk about looking good when they look at, you know, the rest of the bike. Of course, got the mandatory equipment, the Ride Factory air cleaner cover, and Super Trap exhaust. A lot of people don't like Super Trap. I actually love Super Trap. Right now, the sound that the Super Trap gives me, besides the tunability, but the sound that it gives me is freaking amazing for touring because it's not very loud, believe it or not. Now, I might switch to something else just because I want a louder sound. I'm not sure yet. I just, I like being an asshole though, but if you want an exhaust that performs really, really well, but isn't so loud, that your neighbors hate you, Super Trap is always the way to go. This motor has compression releases, and trust me, even though it's got the all balls high torque starter, you need them. All right, ready. up on my microphone but yeah there's a whole lot of clattering going on in there we got rattles from every side of the bike Or maybe you can't hear, but the Makuni also rattles. I mean, not to mention the fairing and the bags, and uh, of course my quick release sissy bar. Now, the Super Trap is not quiet. I'm just saying it's quiet compared to a lot of other exhausts. Anyway, that's enough talking about the bike. Let's go ride it. <laughs> That'll never get old. 
Now, as you can see, this runs a little bit taller than your normal FXR, and I definitely need an extended kickstand. This bike does not mess around. Don't pay attention to my RPM gauge. The tachometer on this needs a little bit of fine tuning. Well, the speedometer and the tach are digital and the digital tach's having a little bit of trouble picking up what this is actually putting down. This is one of those motorcycles when you do like the normal acceleration thing where you kind of take off for a little bit in first and then when you hit second, you gun it. You know, so there's a short shift in first, gun it in second. It feels like you missed your shift and didn't shift out of first because it accelerates so freaking hard. <laughs> yeah, like I was saying, tell you what, this thing's got ass to spare in every gear. And maybe it's just the new motor mounts, but I will tell you this total performance 124 cubic inch engine. I actually feel like it's got way less vibration than my old 80 inch Evo did. I was a little worried because several people told me those s and 124s will break apart these old plastic fairings and I don't want to lose it, but I'll be honest, man, this TP-124, it, it literally shakes less than my old Evo. Again, maybe it's just, maybe it's just new motor mounts, but it's regardless. Yeah, regardless whether it's motor mounts or not. Absolutely worth it. Have I ridden faster bikes? Absolutely, I've ridden faster bikes. I've ridden faster Harleys. So yeah, speed-wise, it feels, I don't know, almost as fast as Road King Kong. The Road King we previously had on the channel that had a 131 in it. The Walkie 8 131, of course, but we also had a Lowrider S with a 131 on the channel and it doesn't feel anywhere near as fast as that. So somewhere in that vicinity. And I will say it's not operating at what it's capable of either. As of right now, this is a mild tune with a mild cam and this motor is very understressed. <laughs> this thing is so funny. I'm a towering 5, 12 and a half and I can barely flat foot this motorcycle. With that 18 inch rear rim, this thing is dirt bike tall and I love that. I'm sure a lot of people are gonna ask how much money I've actually got in this total bill and I'll say it can conservative estimates, way too much money. People always talk about how Harleys are slow and it took a while for this thing to get to ramming speed before uh, a large injection of money. And that's pretty much what it takes to make any Harley Davidson fast, a large injection of money. Now, I got a lot of deals. I still think it's too much for me what I've uh, all told spent on the bike, but you know, you could easily building this motorcycle, if you wanted to make it look nice too, you could easily spend $25,000 building this bike. That's assuming you're getting all brand new stuff like brand new SNS 124 which is over ten thousand dollars like you could I oh man actually you could probably spend more than 25 grand building an FXR like this but nice and you're buying all new parts I think that twenty to twenty five thousand dollars if you're trying to really pinch your pennies and watch your money if you're buying stuff new that's probably what you're gonna spend I've done plenty of work on this FXR myself but when it came to making it right and me wanting to be able to rely on it I did have to lean on the ride factor to help me out. 1-800-ASH-SHELBY, Joe the Mountain Jedi, and of course my man Brian over there. Amazing people. They all know Evos and FXRs inside and out. What do I have in this? I don't know. I have no idea what I have in this bike. It really would be impossible for me to tell because so many of these parts are things that I've gotten and held on to for years. And I just, I mean, I've acquired all the stuff for this motorcycle since I got this FXR. I can't remember everything I've spent money on. I guess some people can. Some people keep spreadsheets and stuff. Uh, you can tell by the state of my motorcycle that I'm not that kind of person. The 18 inch rear wheel and the six speed overdrive, I'm really actually doing quite well at highway speed. Probably would even get better gas miles than I got before, but with 120 plus horsepower uh, and gears one through four, I am not getting good gas mileage. And that's mostly my fault. FXR is a funny beast, man. It's a funny, funny bike. There's still a ton of them out there. They're still super attainable. For a while, the prices got really high, but the market on FXRs is kind of evening out. And I think that has a lot to do with how good the new soft tail is. And yes, these big inch motors, you got to put 93 in it now. 
That sucker was empty. I don't know how Harley Davidson ever in their right minds thought they were getting away with selling a bike and calling it a touring bike. Talk about the FXRD with a four gallon gas tank. No wonder they couldn't sell the FXRDs. I guess the next, and to be honest, quite fair question is, was it worth it? Bubba, that one's gonna be up to you. To me, any amount of money would be worth it. I love this bike. I didn't even have to have the 124 in it. That's something that just happened. Obviously, the original 80 inch that came in it, uh, that motor had ceased to be, it blew up. It's gone on to live in Valhalla. But I still love the bike with the 80 in it. I would have ridden it anywhere with that motor. The 124, it's just a happy accident. How much money do I have in it? Was it worth it? What? Do any of these questions really matter in the face of true love? It's just me and Barf Purdy versus the world, baby. And ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no ocean too deep. Not for this bike. There's a few other things I want to do to the old FXR. As I said before, I want to upgrade the rear suspension. I'll most likely go with Race Tech. They make really good stuff and they'll make shocks to whatever your specification is on the front. I'll probably go with Traction Dynamics and the same Race Tech emulators that I have in there. Traction Dynamics makes awesome custom dampening rods and springs with custom spring rates, which is important if you're carrying around a, a few extra pounds like old Shade Tree Surgeon is. It's got enough other weird stuff on it that I really want to put a Magneto on this. There's nothing wrong with the electronic ignition but magnetos they just look cool and if that matters for you they're emp proof and after that i don't know is it done i don't know an fxr is never really done how long is a piece of string it's it's never done i'll always find something else to do to it or i'll have to do something else to it in order to keep it proceeding as i want it to be so is an fxr for you well maybe after i've described all this to you you're thinking possibly not maybe you want an fxr but you want an fxr without the Sisyphean levels of dedication it takes to keeping them on the road. You might say instead of an FXR, you'll get a Dyna, but a Dyna is not an FXR. Those frames have very little in common, even though a lot of the other stuff, including the engine, at least the Evo engine and, and the running gear, the suspension is the same. The frame is a totally different animal. You might even say you want a new Milwaukee 8 Softail. Again, a totally different animal. It is not an FXR. If you want an FXR, but you don't want any of uh, the FXR issues, what you want is a Road King. In my mind, a Road King is about as close as you can get to an FXR. In fact, I like to say Harley never stopped making the FXR, they just started making the Road King instead. It's a little chunkier, it's a little different, but essentially the frame is almost the same. This particular Road King, the teal deal here, is a twin cam, which is either a bonus or a negative, depending on who you talk to. Most people would say that it being a twin cam is definitely a bonus. And this Road King could be your Road King for 25 bucks. We're giving away this Road King to benefit charity specifically Forgotten Angels, which is a charity who benefits young men and women who've aged out of the foster care system. Shade Tree Army and Brat Star Weirdos, you guys will know about Forgotten Angels already. We've got the camp out coming out in October. You know what they do. You know that so many of these young men and women on their 18th birthday are made homeless by bad acting foster care parents and they're sent out onto the streets with no license, no job, no bank account, no life skills, and no hope. Well, that's where Forgotten Angels comes in. They take these young men and women, they give them the life skills they need to succeed, they teach them how to be productive members of society, and they're basically the parents that they never got. At 18 years old, a lot of these kids are starting from absolute zero. That's where Dave and Cindy from Forgotten Angels come in, and they don't give them another chance, they give them their first chance. And that's where we come in, being bad people doing good things. For 25 bucks, you might win a Road King and a trip to Florida. We'll go out on the boat, go fishing, and we'll give you enough gas money to ride this thing home on your own adventure but even if you don't win you know you're doing a good thing and trust me i know some of you guys y'all need the good karma trust me i do i'm still trying to get in the black myself if you want to join us good-hearted villains and dangerous women that links down below go ahead and click on it i hope i see you at the camp out we'll be drawing the winner for this motorcycle live we'll be flying down to florida and experiencing the wang and all its steamy glory that's enough yapping Let's ride this thing. I'm sweating. I could use a little airflow. Certainly starts up with a lot less drama than the old FXR. Uh, I guess that's pretty accurate. 
to me, that's what Road Kings are. They're FXRs without all the drama. Of course, you can modify them to the hill too. Actually, in the last video where I first introduced this bike and I asked you guys whether we should modify it or not, everyone was pretty much split. I haven't gone through and counted up the comments yet. You know, sometimes we'll modify the bikes that we give away for Forgotten Angels, the ones we raffle off for charity. And sometimes we just leave them alone, especially in the case of Harleys. And we'll let you guys figure it out and you can make it into whatever you want. My vote was for a tractor seat, like a police seat, some wider and slightly higher bars and some white hard bags. I had a few people agree with me. I kind of like the idea of making it look like an old Electroglide. Once again, looking like an old Electroglide shovel head or pan head, but without all the drama. Got plenty of votes for fishtails, which it's a road king. Seems like fishtails ought to be standard equipment. I'm gonna count up all those votes and we'll see if we're doing anything to it. I will tell you this is what we're for sure doing is a cam chest upgrade. Twin cams are notorious for icing their cam chests and you know what? A cam chest upgrade, a Makuni, and some, yeah, you know, not uh, really aggressive cams, but something with a little more pep in its step. I don't think anybody could argue with those as an upgrade. I guess some people could argue with the Makuni. I would prefer that. This has the Morelli fuel injection on it, which was the earlier fuel injection that Harley Davidson used. There's not Nothing really wrong with it. The bike runs fine. It's got no fueling issues, but if it was me, I'd put a flat slide Makuni on it. That's for damn sure. Or Electron. I really love Electron carbs as well. Well, regardless of what happens, somebody's getting this motorcycle. And regardless of who gets the motorcycle, you know you're doing a good thing when you buy a raffle ticket for this bike. Dave and Cindy and Forgotten Angels is truly something special. All you guys who have been here for the camp out already know. The reason why $25 really can make a difference is this money doesn't hit any branches on the way down, man. There's no overhead. There's no board of directors getting paid or treasurer or anything like that. This money goes exactly where it needs to go. And yeah, in a perfect world, our tax dollars and the government would make up for where everywhere else has failed for these young men and women. But we don't live in a perfect world. Like I always tell people, if you don't have anything to give, please don't. Don't put yourself in a bad situation to help somebody else. This is if you have something extra. And even if you have plenty extra, I like to tell people to sacrifice something in order to do it. So if you have plenty of extra and you can buy $100 worth of raffle tickets right now, you know what? Don't go out to eat at McDonald's a few times a week. Don't buy the new video game you were looking at. You know, don't buy that new pair of shoes and instead spend the money on this. Even if you can afford to do both, because I think that when you make that sacrifice and you do it that way, it means a lot more. You're sacrificing something out of your life in order to give something to somebody who has nothing. Now, I don't think a lot of people are actually going to do that. You're probably still going to buy the video game and the raffle tickets. But I'm telling you, you ought to try it out like that every once in a while. It makes it mean a whole lot more. But that's just my own personal philosophy on the matter. And when it comes to personal philosophies, listen up, baby. I got two or three for every occasion. Appreciate you guys hanging out for this one. That link to grab tickets for the teal deal is down below. You know you're supporting a good cause. David, Cindy, and Forgotten Angels. They're all amazing people over there. And I hope I get to see you at the camp out. If you're waiting on a Brapsar order, that should be coming in any day now. We had a little bit of a supply issue, but we're getting that all worked out. So keep your eyes on the mail. They should be showing up real soon. And stay tuned because directly after this episode, we've got a new episode of the Sessions podcast with myself, Jay Lisi, and Jason from Sugar Tree Farm and Sessions out in Oregon. The Brap Star and Sessions collab is going strong. We've got products in the market out there in Oregon, so make sure to ask your local bud tender about them. The podcast isn't all about smoking. This particular episode happens to be about traveling and why sometimes it sucks to travel by motorcycle and why that's actually kind of a good thing. I think it's a really good episode. I think it turned out great. Make sure you stay tuned. That's premiering directly after this episode. Myself, Shay Lisi, and Sugar Tree Jay will be hanging out in the chat. We'll see you there. The link will be down below, but if you're watching this during the premiere, it'll automatically take you there. Till next time, y'all, keep it weird. Crashing through the sky comes a fearful cry. Shade Tree. Army. Shade Tree. Army. Armies of the night. Evil taking flight. Shade Tree. Panic spreading far and wide Can the world oppose The deadliest of foes Shade Tree Army Shade Tree Army Who will risk it all To end the evil call of Shade Tree Army Shade Tree Never give
give up, they never say die Walking tall with banners high Shade Tree Army, a ruthless gang of scum, villains, freaks, and bikers Determined to rule the world